To answer the why of all this, we need to understand the false reality that President Donald Trump has created for a large portion of the United States, an alternate version of events that have no basis in fact, but is nonetheless more believable to those who accept it. This false reality reinforces a pre-existing worldview and is therefore more appealing than the facts. If facts present themselves that contradict the worldview, they can be discarded. And if alternate facts with no basis in reality present themselves that reinforce the worldview, they can be swallowed whole regardless of their illegitimacy. That worldview includes right-wing nationalism and, for some, ultra-nationalism. Nationalism as public policy is the prioritization of the nation over the world or foreign interests, which is not unusual, but nationalism as a movement and a culture is different. Trump's supporters are not nationalists in the sense that they are policy wonks with complex thoughts about the United States' relationship with its allies. They are nationalists in the sense that they believe in the uniqueness and special status of themselves as Americans, and that their conception of what it means to be an American is not simply residency in the United States, but adherence to socially conservative values that they believe define the United States. Deviation from these values are un-American, and present those deviating as part of an out-group that exists outside the protection of the in-group. Not only separate groups, but a hierarchy of groups. Divisions often based on political affiliation, race, religion, and other factors. Donald Trump stoked this pre-existing nationalism by using fanciful, largely false imagery about a mythic past in the history of the United States in which the nation was great, assigning this period never by an exact date, but suggesting it was from before the end of segregation based on some of his statements about the police and protesters. A movement based on far-right ultranationalism that is reliant on a mythic past to justify a cultural hierarchy is called a fascist movement. One tactic of fascists is to define fascism as something else, purposefully confusing the opposition and enablers so that their movement can continue unabated. Fascism is an ideology and a movement, but not a form of government, in the same way that conservatism is an ideology and a movement, but not a form of government. For a more thorough explanation of fascism, please see the video MAGA and Fascism in the description. Fascism is inherently duplicitous due to its reliance on a mythic past and scapegoat enemies. Because of this, it requires the maintenance of the aforementioned false reality. Trump's false reality operates like this. Anything positive said about Trump is truth-telling, and anything negative said about Trump is fake news. Because of Trump's close relationship with conservative media figures, the term fake news was propagated and was falsely legitimized by pundits for their political and economic interests. Responding to criticism by claiming fake news is a strategy of non-engagement, dismissing lies and misdeeds by claiming that they never happened. Trump supporters don't have to interrogate thousands upon thousands of lies because they only have to believe one lie, the big lie the one that tells them that everything negative said about Trump is false, that criticism of Trump is not legitimate, but the result of Trump derangement syndrome. The most pervasive and most relevant aspect of the false reality in early 2021 is the mistaken belief that Trump actually won the 2020 election and that Joe Biden and the Democratic Party have subverted the will of the American people, somehow changing millions of votes. The evidence of this fraud is nearly non-existent, reliant on anonymous figures with nothing tangible but a platform in conservative media. Nearly every lawsuit has been dismissed, partly due to lack of evidence, and these lawsuits were dismissed in part by conservative judges, appointed by Republican presidents. It's not bias. There's just no evidence. Nothing. Trump claimed that looking at his crowds, he should have won because Biden did not draw crowds. This argument played well with supporters who regularly attended his crowds in a seeing-is-believing kind of sense. However, crowd size does not equal voter turnout, and Biden simply opted not to have many rallies for obvious health concerns during the pandemic. It was dangerously irresponsible of Trump to hold his rallies. Trump said that the Dominion machines regularly turned out false results, which has been debunked, and a variety of other harebrained theories that originated predominantly on social media. 
With this in mind, it is undeniable that Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election, and this reality is not dependent on our preference. Nevertheless, due to the pre-constructed false reality, centuries of Americans being told that the president is a trustworthy authority, and a right-wing media apparatus that saw ratings, an uncomfortably large portion of the population has accepted this obvious nonsense and transparent power grab. To believe otherwise would mean deconstructing their false reality that has given them so much comfort. To them, believing that Joe Biden simply won the election has greater consequences than merely accepting a Democrat will be president. Democrats have certainly been president before. Believing Joe Biden won the election not only means believing Trump lost, but also believing that Trump has been lying to them about the fraud. After years of living in a false reality, coming to terms with everything they knew to be a lie is too traumatic to consider. With this trauma staring them in the face, Trump's supporters have retreated even further into their false reality. And the further inside they go, the more convinced they are that Trump is right. And the more convinced they are that Trump is right, the more they feel justified taking any action that supports Trump. Because supporting Trump means fighting back against the coming trauma of realizing that their entire worldview, everything they believed in, was wrong. On December 19th, after weeks of falsely claiming that he won the election, Donald Trump declared that there must be a wild protest to stop the certification of Joe Biden. His supporters began calling the event just that. The attendance of the rally and the insurrection of the Capitol was organized predominantly through alternative social media platforms like Parler and Telegram, as well as message boards like 4chan and 8kun. On the night before the Save America Wild Rally in Washington, D.C., activists protested outside the home of Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri. Hawley was one of the loudest Republican supporters of the erroneous fraud allegation. Hawley took to the media, claiming that those gathered were Antifa and that they were threatening his family. However, the entire protest was recorded and Hawley's claims were disproved. Republicans often use Antifa as their boogeyman and exaggerate what anti-fascist counter-protesting actually is. Remember that for later. On the morning of January 6th, thousands of Trump supporters flooded Washington, D.C., many of them there to protest and to see Donald Trump speak, many of them there to storm the Capitol, but all with the goal of stopping Joe Biden from being certified as the next president. A variety of far-right groups attended the rally. The Proud Boys, a neo-fascist, men-only collection of modern-day brown shirts and Donald Trump's unofficial armed militia, in the days prior, their leader had been arrested for participating in the vandalization of a church, as well as weapons charges, and the Proud Boys were obviously riled up about that. Also attending were the Three Percenters, which is a far-right militia, Nationalist Social Club, an explicitly neo-Nazi organization, specifically NSC-131, QAnon conspiracy theorists, and quite frankly, a number of police officers. Not undercover police officers hoping to quell a riot, but simply law enforcement in support of Donald Trump. This was confirmed by Politico. It is important not to underestimate the danger this posed, not only because of which groups were there, but because a great number of those attending were armed. On the morning of January 6th, Donald Trump gave a speech in which he said he would never concede, repeating his lie that the election was fraudulent and that his supporters should march to the United States Capitol, where they were about to certify the Electoral College votes. Republican Congressman Mo Brooks spoke at the rally, saying, Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. Republican Congressman Madison Hawthorne also spoke at the rally, declaring, This crowd has some fight. Once again, bear in mind that Trump and his cronies were telling all of this to avowed fascists, neo-Nazis, conspiracy theorists, and militias. Rudy Giuliani then slithered onto the stage and told the crowd that this must be decided by a trial by combat. And that is what happened. After years of fomenting hatred, beginning his campaign by calling Mexicans rapists, then double-downing on it in the media, calling white supremacist marchers very fine people, siding with fascist groups like the Proud Boys, and creating a false reality around himself, Trump sparked a violent insurrection into the United States Capitol. Five people are dead. It could have been a lot worse. 
In addition to many of the insurrectionists being armed, 11 homemade bombs were found in a truck parked near the Capitol, and at least two pipe bombs were found on the scene and removed before they could explode. Some insurrectionists brought zip ties in order to take hostages. The latest reporting is that many insurrectionists were there to capture or kill Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Mike Pence. The only reason no congressmen or senators were killed or taken hostage is because many of the buildings on Capitol Hill have underground evacuation tunnels that connect to one another. This was not a protest. This was not simply trespassing. And it was not even merely a riot. Civil disobedience is not always bad if the intentions and goals are just. This was not civil disobedience. This was an active, violent attempt to force the loser of an election to remain in power through terrorism. According to reports, Trump's administration initially refused to send in the National Guard to retake the Capitol. This is still a developing story at the time of writing, but signs point to Vice President Pence eventually making that call, regardless of his authority to do so. Aides to Donald Trump have said that he was very happy about the storming of the Capitol. He was excited and pleased that this happened. Let's be perfectly clear. If these insurrectionists were not white, there would have been greater security in the first place, as there was at the Lincoln Memorial in preparation for a Black Lives Matter protest not long ago. The application of the police against people of color is consistently different than the application of the police against white people in the United States. And if anyone has ever thought otherwise, remember January 6, 2021. Once the dust settled, the insurrectionists took selfies with police officers, and nearly all of them were gently escorted outside of the Capitol. Trump made a short video right after the incident that he inspired, praising the violent insurrectionists, stating, We love you. You're very special. This was said by the President of the United States about domestic terrorists. Trump suggested his supporters may as well go home, a passing comment in an address that still praised terrorism. The video finally broke Twitter, as they took the unprecedented action of removing it. Too little too late, Jack. Later in the day, the House and Senate reconvened to certify Joe Biden as the next president. Many Republican congressmen and senators continued spreading their lie about the election, even though this lie was what caused armed insurrectionists to storm their building and threatened to cause harm or death to their colleagues. A few Republicans who had been beating this particular drum backed down under the circumstances, but many did not. Senator Howley, caught in a lie less than 24 hours ago, crawled out from under his desk and continued his erroneous accusations. Ted Cruz trumpeted his nonsense for all to hear. He wants to be the next Trump. Praising Mitt Romney is physically hard for me to do, but in fairness, he did make one good point while standing against his Republican colleagues. Another recount, audit, or investigation would be pointless because there is no amount of evidence that will ever convince people who believe in Donald Trump. The false reality will always color everything that they see and all the evidence that they receive. The certification went long into the night until it finally concluded. Some in the media are still hung up on whether or not to call what happened on January 6th an attempted coup and whether or not to call them terrorists. Whether one considers the events of January 6th a violent coup by domestic terrorists attended by provable white supremacists and fascists designed to interrupt or change the lawful democratic process, or a violent insurrection by far-right militias attended by provable white supremacists and fascists designed to interrupt or change the lawful democratic process, is not particularly salient. Everything else in the description is still accurate, no matter how charitably one views the events of that day. Conservative media and Trump supporters who were not present engaged in a cognitive dissonance declaring that the people who violently stormed the United States Capitol were brave patriots, and that this was only instigated by leftist agitators. The right says, It was a good thing that we did, and if it was bad, it wasn't us anymore. Imagine thinking some outside agitator has more influence over the supporters of Donald Trump than Donald Trump himself. As if Donald Trump was not calling for this, 
as if Donald Trump just happened to be the name on all of their flags. This was briefly circulated by an erroneous article in the Washington Times about facial recognition software, but it was quickly debunked by the corporation that makes the software. The Washington Times has since taken down the article. The insurrectionists were not revolutionaries or anarchists. They were not raging against the machine, they were raging in favor of the machine. It would be very helpful if the media could simply look up what the word anarchism actually means. The insurrectionists were not trying to dismantle the state and create a society without unjust hierarchies. They were trying to keep a fascist president in power. Let's be clear. The ludicrous notion that protesting injustice and protesting justice are the same, that the radical left and the radical right have similar goals, that being anti-fascist is the same as being fascist, and that the fascists are not fascists is not true. Fascists and their enablers prefer to downplay fascist activities like the events of January 6th, often by citing the failure of the fascists. If the fascists failed to accomplish their goal, then their attempt is hand-waved away. This is designed to provide cover for fascism in the present, as well as allow further attempts in the future, until they win. So, what lessons have we learned from this tragedy, and what do we do now? Well, one lesson is that if people carefully explain, day after day, year after year, the dangers of a growing fascist movement in the United States by citing historical example after historical example, and how these examples parallel what is happening today, maybe take them seriously next time. Because the uncomfortable truth is that there will be a next time. This is not over when Trump leaves office. The false reality cannot be so easily deconstructed. They don't want to deconstruct it. Deconstructing the false reality all at once would be too traumatic for them. So it's not happening anytime soon. Fascism will outlive Trump, which means we have to outmaneuver fascism. A lot of satisfied people with nothing to lose tell counter-protesters to stay home because it will only embolden the fascists. But if you ask any counter-protest organizer, that is quite literally the opposite effect. When fascist groups organize and announce a rally, counter-protesters announce themselves as the opposition. And generally speaking, one of two things happen. Either the fascists chicken out and cancel the rally altogether, or the rally goes ahead but with far fewer fascists than expected. The opposition, the counter-protest, ends up outnumbering the fascists, and they are demoralized and defeated. Fascism is a cult of strength, and appearing weak is their only sin. When Richard Spencer got punched only once, it ruined his image with other fascists, and when counter-protesters began to outnumber his people at rallies, he soon disappeared until he tried and failed to rebrand himself as a Biden supporter, something laughed at and rejected by the right, the left, and Biden himself. When fascist organizer Jason Kessler planned Unite the Right 2 in Washington, D.C. a few years back, the counter-protest was so enormous that almost nobody on the fascist side even showed up, and they were surrounded by the entire city. Kessler has barely been seen since, and reportedly moved back in with his parents. Counter-protests also provide opportunities to photograph fascists to expose them, something that rightfully terrifies them and has them fear for their jobs. The events of January 6th got so out of control because there was so little counter-protest. Some organizers, understandably concerned for their health, with so many violent militia groups occupying the city, limited their counter-protest. It was completely understandable under the circumstances. Without a counter-protest to keep fascists in line, they will do whatever they want. The police are not going to do enough to stop them. Sometimes the police are part of them. There were some cops who actively held the line, yes, and some that let them roam free. We can't bet on the police being on our side. When you tell anti-fascist counter-protesters to stay home and just ignore the fascists, this is the result. Without an active resistance and a presence that makes fascists feel unwelcome and unsafe, this is how far they will go. Or further. If there was ever any doubt about the efficacy and necessity of a counter-protest presence, the proof is what happened inside the Capitol. If there had been a counter-protest of equal or greater size, the fascists would not have made it that far. Information on legal direct action against fascism is in the description.
A poll of Democratic, Republican, and Independent voters conducted shortly after the insurrection found that 45% of Republicans approve of the violent takeover of the Capitol, and only 43% disapproved of it. Other polls have had more encouraging numbers, with fewer Republicans approving of the insurrection, but the approval rating is still a not insignificant amount of Republicans. The events of January 6th cannot be hand-waved as an isolated incident and the work of a fringe group if so many Republicans agree with it. The false reality is stronger than ever. There is already another armed march on the Capitol being planned for later this month. Fascism, historically, is not stopped through a vote. Stopping fascism will require us to step up and to stop thinking that this is over, or that we will be saved by Joe Biden. This movement will not end on January 20th. In fact, that day in Washington, D.C. could be another flashpoint.